several years ago, uh, we were approached by a medical device company that was really in the trading business. And uh, they wanted to take medical devices uh, that were coming off of lease from the large hospitals and then uh, refurbish them and sell them into the Indian market. So our first job at, at my company was to help figure out whether that was feasible, uh, find a market for them, get them appointments, and they were successful very quickly in making some sales into India. So that was the cakewalk part. Now uh, time came to ship the first of these devices. It was a piece of capital equipment, and all of a sudden the shipping company, a very large company whom all of us know, and you've probably seen their trucks every day, uh, they approached this company and they said, we've got this piece of equipment that we want to send to India. And uh, they didn't get a positive answer. So, uh, so they came back to us and they said, hey, you know, can you help with this? And I just finished writing my book on doing business in India at the time. Uh, this book here, which you might have seen on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the booth over there. Um, and one of the things I had done was interview the uh, number two person at this company. So I said, hey, let me try and reach uh, the highest levels of this company and try and get an answer for you. But in the meantime, I also sent an email to a couple of smaller companies that, uh, that I knew were fairly nimble. Uh, well, the CEO of this large company referred us to someone who referred us to someone who referred us to someone, and ultimately, we got to the person in Chicago who was responsible for this, and uh, this took a couple of weeks, and he sent a one-line email saying uh, that you cannot ship used medical devices into India. Okay, that's very interesting. Well, in the meantime, the other smaller company that we had contacted had informed us that uh, you could send medical devices into India if you got a professional engineer to certify its characteristics for a couple of hundred dollars. And by the time we heard back from this large company, the device was already sitting in India, going through customs. So I forwarded the shipping bill to, uh, to uh, this uh, uh, large shipping company that we all know and love, uh, saying, you know, here's the result that has actually happened. Um, so this is one little story. Um, um, there are many, many such stories. I'll tell you a more recent one. We were approached by a very large electronics distributor. And they wanted to, they sell their products into India remotely. They have no people in India, no offices, no employees. Uh, they do have an India-specific website and they sell a fairly significant amount of product into India. Uh, they wanted to start uh, a process where Indian customers who are all businesses could pay in rupees rather than dollars, okay? And so uh, before I went to my team uh, in, uh, in India, I said, let's do a little experiment. Let's ask each of the big banks whether this can be done, okay? And so we went to Citibank and Chase and uh, Wells Fargo and State Bank and you name it. And the initial answer we got back from all of them was no. You have to have a subsidiary in India to do this. And I see uh, uh, Meher smiling here uh, because, uh, of course, the key thing in India is not the problem you want to solve, but how you ask the question. Okay? So we went back two weeks later and asked, you know, according to the Reserve Bank of India on this particular web page, here's the kind of account we want to open. Can an American company do that? And all of a sudden, the answer was, yes, of course it can. Okay? The message that I want to deliver to you with that is that uh, when you're dealing with India, it's always complicated. And a lot of what you get from professional advisors is not just the answers, but the right questions to ask. So keep that in mind when you are thinking about India. Um, we have a brilliant panel here today. Uh, on my immediate right is uh, Lawrence Ratkin. Uh, he spent 23 years at General Electric. Uh, GE, as you might know, uh, sold their first product into India almost 100 years ago and has been successful in so many different businesses. He is now with Dhruva Advisors, uh, providing uh, international tax planning and guidance and advice. And to his right is Mihir Parikh with uh, Nishi Desai and Associates. Um, uh, Mihir is uh, a PhD and MBA. 
his background and his PhD was in artificial intelligence uh, some years ago and has been advising both Indian companies and American companies on how to do business across the, uh, the, 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 two, the two large democracies. And so he brings a very, very interesting perspective on how to go about uh, doing this. Uh, my name is Gunjan Bagla and I run a company called Amrit, A-M-R-I-T-T, -T, and we advise American companies on how to do business in India. So uh, we'll try and reserve some time for questions at the end of our panel. But let me start by asking both of you, uh, what's one good thing that has happened relating to business between US and India? You can pick the last year or the time since the last prime minister, the current prime minister was elected, whichever time frame you want. But one good thing that you see has happened. Go ahead, Lawrence. Um, I would say there are more than, uh, there's more than one. So Let's it's, pick it's one. Rel <laughs> relatively easy to answer. The story is actually, I think, evolving, but all very positive. And I think uh, we're going to see that continue. The Modi government has been very good about opening India up, solving problems, um, going through, just breaking through barriers. And so on the tax side, which is the area that I spend the most time in, um, breaking down state barriers to trade through the GST introduction, and the introduction of the GST has been fantastic because I think it'll help promote pan-Indian trade very successfully. Uh, so the Modi government pioneered that. People said it couldn't be done. It's kind of a tax example, but I think it's a good example of trade, tax, and investment that's been pioneering and will be sea change really for India. There are other tax examples I could give you just in terms of the U.S.-Indian relationship. So there is definitely more than one. But I see the government very focused on breaking barriers down, and, and so I think we're going to see that continue a bit. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mihir, you want to? Um, yeah, just I will take 30 seconds to thank Tai for inviting us uh, on this panel. Um, especially I want to thank Neha. Neha Mishra, she has done a fantastic job uh, making sure uh, uh, we are settled down. Um, about India, a lot has happened. As you've seen, uh, India has become orange, just like US has become orange. Um, the change in terms of regulation and other things are there. But what I really see, Gunjan, is a change in attitude. Indians have started believing in themselves that they can do wonders in the world, within India. So a lot of investment now is coming from within India as opposed to outside of India. And that's, I think, a big change, the change towards uh, how we see entrepreneurship in India. Uh, versus how we seen entrepreneurship earlier. People were more interested in government job. Now nobody wants government job. Well, some do. But people really want to become an entrepreneur. And that's uh, the change, which is a long-lasting change. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. Let's find out a little bit about the audience here. So how many of you are looking at India as a back office or R&D center, engineering center, something of that nature, as a cost center? Okay, so quite a few people, I'd say maybe a third. How many of you are looking at India as a place to make revenue, to sell your products? Okay, so almost 20% or so. And are any of you looking for, to India as a place to buy products, ingredients, technologies, IP, anything like that? Anybody? No one? Okay, all right, this helps us inform uh, our process as we go on with the, uh, with the rest of the discussion. Um, so I would like to ask uh, each of you now, within the last year, what has changed, what is one thing that has changed that causes India to be a more risky place or a one step backward that might have been taken between US-India business relations, regulations, however you want to address it? Why don't you start this time, Meher? Um. See, there is nothing like good and bad, because anything that there is a, whenever regulatory policy comes in, there is a ba bad side and there is a good side. For example, GST. GST on all, it's very good because it got rid of excise tax, it got rid of all these small, small taxes, which were creating problem. But GST implementation has been a problem because how you will be paying, to which state you will be paying, and what percentage you will be paying, all that implementation has not gone well, and that is creating problem, whether you are looking at India as a revenue or even as a development center. 
you have to look into that how you are paying your royalty, how are you withholding taxes will happen, GST will happen, all of that you have to keep in mind. Okay, so the implementation of GST, just like the implementation of demonetization the year before, has not been as smooth as, as, uh, as it could have been. Totally, exactly. totally. Now, India's GDP this year will exceed that in absolute dollar terms, uh, will exceed that of the UK and of France. So, India is now not only in purchasing power parity, but in real dollar terms, is becoming a world force. Uh, you know, in, in terms of its uh, economic wealth. And I think that creates uh, much more attention focused on India. Uh, L Lawrence, how would you uh, characterize so, the one big problem that might have come up? I, I agree totally with me here. The execution process is really important. I, I think another one is really uh, the risk of a backlash. So just how deep deeply entrenches the bureaucracy and how much of a push the Modi administration will make against that. We've seen, I think, enormous change in different sectors. We gave a number of examples, GST being one. Um, and I, I think that you can only, so a lot of it is very concentrated in Delhi and a lot of concentrated at the top. And the question really is, how far will that penetrate into the bureaucracy, into the various streams of government? So we'll see this have longevity. So there's a tremendous risk that after a year or two that this is all going to be for naught because the bureaucracy will have, you know, Modi will move on, he might lose the election. So we'll see the changes, the changes that we want that we think will help India progress will not come to fruition over the long term. Sure, I totally understand what you're saying. Now, from the perspective of what we do at Amrit, I see a big mitigating factor to that particular risk, uh, the, the genie that, uh, uh, that Narendra Modi has uncorked, is the ability for states to start competing with each other. You know, he was the first chief minister to become prime minister. And so he understands how things work at the state. And we clearly see that at least half a dozen states are really pushing hard to encourage and you know, attract investment and streamline the processes. It's not just Gujarat anymore, it's Andhra Pradesh, it's, uh, you know, it's Maharashtra to some extent and a few other states that are, uh, that are figuring pretty highly on, uh, you know, on this. Uh, not only the desire to attract investment, but the actual execution to support it. And, uh, and so I am hopeful, Lawrence, that uh, this, you know, no matter who gets elected next year, whether it is uh, the BJP or an, an alternate uh, that this trend about competing, the states competing with one another would, would continue. But only time will tell and the bureaucracy certainly will find a way to slow things down. I mean, the GST has been such a powerful force in India, but we have the world's most complicated GST by far. Five different rates and tooth powder being one rate, toothpaste being another rate. Uh, you know, restaurants being at one rate if they are air-conditioned and, and a different rate if they are not, it's very, very complicated. Uh, but hopefully, uh, uh, things will keep moving in the right direction. Um, so let's now get down into the specific issues and let's start, you know, it's like similar to the previous panel, people were talking about the team and people. Okay. Now, if you're a startup here in the Silicon Valley or anywhere in the United States and you're looking to hire people in India, either people to work at your engineering or tech center, or people to, uh, you know, to, to run your sales and marketing in India. Uh, the challenges and problems that you might face are different from hiring in California, where you worry about whether it's an independent contractor or employee, uh, you worry about uh, getting sued by your employee. You know, the concerns in India can be very different. Uh, can, uh, Lawrence, can you uh, try and address uh, what, what are the things that a startup should be worried about if they're hiring people in India as distinct from the U.S.? Well, I think, um, again, my specialty is more tax than, mo than these types of issues. But um, from what I, when I talk to people, I think mobility is probably where your talent is located and importing mobility into India. Um, is a major factor. So, you know, we, for better or for worse, there's just huge talent around the world and people want to use and leverage that talent wherever it may be. And one of the biggest barriers to that really is just mobility of human capital. And so to the extent India will make that easier, 
I think will help its startup, uh, startup succeed and its established enterprises succeed. And again, on this front, I see India making tremendous progress. If I, you know, I actually worked for a big company for, and I started in India in the 90s. At that time, getting into India, moving people into India was, ext I mean, it was just a world of a difference. Um, and now it's actually much easier. You arrive at the airport. I mean, there are people that can arrive at the airport and get electronic visas within 24 hours. Mobility is key. So if you want to succeed, and the Indian government understands this, I think, it's bring the right people in, getting them in fast, and being able to add value to the Indian economy. Well, we need you to say that in Washington as well. Yeah, to the current I, I say it's kind of ironic because <laughs> lots of uh, you know, panels out here, I'm looking at immigration sign and how yeah. difficult it is to get yeah. in this country, but let's not go there. Yeah. So. Meher, how would you like yeah, to address that? Uh, I agree with uh, Lawrence on the mobility, but whenever you go to India, whether it's a development center or revenue center, first thing you have to hire people. So you have to that time decide whether you are going to hire them on your payroll or you are going to hire them as a contractor. In both situations, you have different kind of rules. There is a recently, last year, India passed a law about uh, Contract Labor Amendment Act, uh, which defines how do you hire the contractors. Uh, if you're hiring employees, then you have to deal with the labor law. Uh, now you have to understand culturally and sociologically and politically, India has been more favorable to employees. Uh, so the laws are more geared towards emplo uh, employees as opposed to employers. So that's something you have to keep in mind. There are issues regarding uh, ESOPs, uh, because a lot of time you want to hire people with ESOP. Uh, so those things you have and to Can you explain what an ESOP is? For oh, sure. Benefit uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, employee ex uh, uh, stock ex uh, uh, option plan. Uh, ESOP is uh, when you hire people to do the same job with less pay. Uh, assuming that you'll do great job uh, and their stock value will go up and one day they have a big exit, uh, IPO or maybe some merger acquisition. Uh, so idea is that uh, especially in the software and technology field, uh, ESOP uh, has become very popular. Uh, other thing you need to keep in mind is uh, uh, NDA, non-disclosure agreement, non-compete agreement. Uh, you also want to make sure that uh, those things are properly in place as per the Indian law. Uh, IP, a lot of time IP gets created as these people work on your software program. You want to make sure the IP gets transferred to you as opposed to those individuals who are creating those IP. And depending on uh, how you are looking at investment and all that, you also want to see where your IP is held, whether in India or is it held outside in some Singapore jurisdiction or even US jurisdiction. So those are different kind aspects of things you want to keep in mind when you are looking on the hiring people and HR aspect. Okay, so while we are on the subject of people, uh, what about mobility? You hire somebody in India, they are working for your Indian subsidiary and they worked there for two, three years, and you want to bring them now to the US. Uh, it used to be fairly easy under the L1 visa. Is that process changed considerably in your experience? Maybe? Oh, yeah, yeah. See, L1 visa was mostly, again, I'm, uh, we are Indian law firm. We only practice Indian law. Uh, although I tell my clients and our people that, you know, there are three parts in a company, software, hardware, and Delaware. Uh, you take care of software and hardware, we take care of Delaware. Um, the idea is that although we don't practice U.S. law, but we have seen our clients facing significant challenge because of the change in law. At the same time, think about H H-1 visa. So many people are applying. You're going for lottery. I mean, you want the right person to come, and the person doesn't win the lottery. What do you do? So I completely agree. That it's it's difficult. Okay, let's move uh, from the people to the next issue around capital. So uh, here in Silicon Valley, I think starting with the late 1990s, you know, uh, the VCs realized that for the same amount of money, you could get a better bang for your buck by putting your engineers in India. And so for a while, the flow was always, you know, Sand Hill Road firms getting, you know, funding a U.S. company that then put a tech, tech center, tech office back in India. And uh, that now, I think, has evolved to the point where you have uh, Indian VCs, Indian private equity funds, Indian angels are also investing. And some of them are investing in companies in India that now come to the US. There's flow going in both directions. So I know, um, Meher, that your firm was one of the first to kind of use the Mauritius route 
to invest into India. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, uh, India has uh, had a special treaty with the small island nation in the Indian Ocean where uh, investments through that were treated preferentially. I mean, I'm abbreviating very, very much to describe that and correct me if I'm saying something wrong. That, that treaty has changed. Yeah, change. that treaty has changed <laughs> now. It's yeah. a story and for another day. Yeah. yeah. Um, so today, when money is flowing either in either direction, capital, I'm not talking about working capital, but investment capital, uh, mm -hmm. what does a startup entrepreneur need to know about where to raise this money and then where to put it between the US and India? Well, so, both of you. Yeah. Go ahead, Lawrence. Uh, so um, I, I would say if you're talking about Indian-based companies, uh, ultimately, if they want to succeed, they're going to have to try and reach into the U.S. capital markets. The markets are deepest here. A lot of Indian companies sort of face what they call a point of where they um, – they can't reach enough into the Indian market, and so the question is how do they access the U.S. market? It is extremely difficult. It will be actually uh, impractical for an Indian-based company to do so as an Indian-based company. So we at Druva, for example, work on a number of efforts to try and what we call flip those structures into U.S.-based structures to essentially take an Indian-based company and make it a subsidiary of a U.S.-based company. As a U.S.-based company, it can access the U.S. markets. People are more familiar with it. You can, you can tr uh, find on you know, the taps of wealth, the spigots, if you will, to do that. Now, that's extremely complicated. And obviously, startups who begin in India naturally will start as Indian-based companies. There is a man small amount of seed capital sure. in the Indian itself that will, will foster that. But essentially, as you become more global and more successful, that's going to be what you need to do. And that's rather complicated and something I think you need advice, okay. um, sure. advice and counsel. Um, I mean, it's a long story, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when Infosys uh, did that ADR, we were lawyer to Infosys. So uh, at that time, there was a trend towards doing ADR, which is American Depository Receipt. You uh, have a stock exchange uh, listing in India. You come to U.S. and do the listing in U.S. at New York Stock Exchange ADR. So we, we were a lawyer to uh, Infosys, uh, Wipro, and many other at that time. So there was a trend where they were all coming to U.S. to tap into the capital market in U.S. I haven't seen that in many years, uh, simply because for companies, it's easier to get money through different routes into India. And there are many different ways uh, you can get money into India. What we call very common is a foreign uh, direct investment or FDI. Then there is also another route called foreign portfolio investment, FPI. And then also there is a foreign venture a capital investor route. So you have to decide on what route you will take money into India, the capital money. Uh, you also uh, need to understand the pluses and minuses of that. And whenever you're investing money into India, this is a very unique problem of India, which I will take one minute to explain. In most countries, when you exit, there's a capital gains, right? In most places, all the Mauritius didn't have it, and India benefited from that, or at least a lot of investment going into India benefited from that. Uh, India has fair value market, uh, uh, fair market value concept. So when you are investing money into in India, the price at which you invest will be compared against the fair value. And if your investment is higher than the fair value, then company will be taxed on the money that is coming in. And the value is lower than the fair value, then the investor will be taxed when the money is coming in. And that's unique. Another aspect is when you're exiting. I would say that's crazy, but anyhow. I know, exactly, Royce, right? Everybody thinks it's crazy, but that's the way it is. And that coming out of from because of um, uh, legacy reasons of people using that as a corruption and all that, uh, valuing their own investment as lower value uh, and things like that. Going, not going into those details. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, and when you exit, that's another problem with India. When you are exiting, uh, let's say an American company buys another company, which is also American. So American company buying American company, so there's a capital gain there. Um, what India does, looks at what percentage of income for the American company derive from India operations. An Indian government will have a right if it is 60%, Indian government will have a right to charge capital gain on that, although American company buying American company, okay? 
Now, America will also say we also have a right to charge because it's American company and American company buying American company, so there is a capital gain in America. So now you have a situation of double taxation. So these are the different quirks that you need to keep in mind, and at that time you really need a good lawyer and good professional advisor uh, on the tax side to understand that how do you structure your transaction so you can avoid this double taxation. Okay, great. Uh, so let so me I, I just yeah. just on that yeah. point. I think we're, we're less, talking yeah. about uh -huh. yeah two different paradigms. I, I agree with everything we're here. So for mainstream investment. Um, I think into India, if you're a mainstream established company, the rules have actually become a little bit easier, but they're still fairly complicated. You still have to go through RBI, FEMA, various other requirements, but you can inject more debt more easily, so there's that. Um, for startups, I think at the end of the day, you're going you're gonna to have a challenge just in terms of attracting investment, and that's where I was talking about doing a flip structure. I think those are opportunities sure. as well. But as Mihir said, you need intelligent, sophisticated advice to make that happen. Okay. So if I, uh, the audience has questions, please line up before the mic. I'm going to ask one more question of, of, uh, of uh, both of the panelists. So we talked about how venture capitalists decided to use lower cost engineers from India. Uh, should startup entrepreneurs use lower cost advisors from India rather than any of us? I, I, well, I. I don't even know where to start with that one. So uh, um, I'll tell you where to start, Lawrence. You can go out of Churchgate. How many of you are from Mumbai? Right? Or how many of you have been to Mumbai? You know Churchgate. The moment you walk out of Churchgate station, there is somebody, some guy on a stool giving you tax advice, doing your filing. Oh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, you can also get your hair cut while you're doing that. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but having said that, like Lawrence said, I totally agree. It's very complicated. It's important that you pay little investment up front in order to avoid big losses down the road. And especially when you are getting into trouble, what will happen? A big investor wants to come in and you have all these compliance issues. Your new investment, your exit, either will get delayed or the valuation will go down or sometime even your investor will flip out. So I think what you're saying is it's too expensive to use cheap advice. Is that, is that what there you're saying? You yeah. Well, okay. I, look, I, I don't think you can outsource experience and judgment at the end of the day. Right. So I worked for a company that, a fairly large multinational that outsourced a lot of activities very successfully. And in, in almost every instance, the reason it succeeds is because you have someone at the other end who manages that sure. with judgment and experience. Okay. So, if you're, so until you, so <laughs> in essence, you get what you pay for if, you, if you don't do that. Okay, let's go to the audience, please. Good. Please uh, state uh, your name and your question briefly. Sure. Just uh, questions you asked today are free. There is no bill to be paid. Now, if you ask me in my office, it's a different issue. Good. Excellent. My name is uh, Farhat Ali. Uh, we are trying to set up a manufacturing, small manufacturing startup uh, company in uh, India. And the question is, when you are transferring money to India, is it better to do it as a loan? Or you know, how do you go about setting up the equity portion of the financing of your Indian uh, manufacturing arm? Sure. Um, you want? OK. Um, two things you want to keep in mind. One is that India also has an exchange control law which means uh, FEMA, which is called uh, Foreign uh, Exchange Management Act, uh, or, uh, Act uh, where uh, you need to make sure that the f money that is going into India happens through banking channel, which is the banking channel which is approved by Reserve Bank of India. So that's one part. Second is the purpose for which you are sending. That purpose has to be defined properly. Uh, then comes the issue of whether you want to take it as equity or you want to take it as a debt. Well, it, two aspects of that. Both are restricted in some ways. Uh, when you're taking as equity, then you also have this fair market value that we talked about it. Another is depending on what kind of manufacturing you're doing, most FDI is uh, unrestricted. But having said that, which means you don't have to ask for permission, but you still have to do a lot of disclosure filing. Okay. Now, if your in, uh, manufacturing is restricted, then you have to get the permission for investment. And sometimes it can be capped at 49% or 74%, something like that. So when it is capped, you want to definitely make sure that by negligence, you don't exceed that cap, even when you uh, bring in more money later on. Because when you exceed the cap, then you uh, default uh, uh, in the violation. 
Okay, thanks. So there are lots of firms that help advise in this sector, and if you're talking about foreign investment in India, my firm also does a tremendous amount of work advising people on capitalization, structuring, planning, um, FDI approvals that you need, which sector you're in, whether it's 100% controlled, whether you're allowed to invest, just all these questions need to be answered in, in establishing a manufacturing facility, and of course, which state you're located in as well exactly. can, be, yeah, sure. can be important as well. Yeah. Yeah.